You just want to smear as much as possible. Oh, meanwhile, if you look over here at this filament, 100 cubic millimeters per second. I'll be the first to admit that I have a problem. I'm addicted to upgrading my 3D printer. As soon as I finish one batch of upgrades, I'll print a couple of things out, but I'm ready to upgrade my printer again. So let's get into the video and see if we can upgrade this Ender 2 to its final form. The emphasis of today's episode is to quiet the printer down using these new fans and to increase speed using some new nozzles. Let's start by looking at the nozzles. Wait, actually, we've got one more nozzle here. Let's start by looking at the nozzles. If we work our way from left to right, this is the standard brass Ender 3 nozzle. This is the upgraded copper Ender 3 nozzle. Basically, copper has a higher thermal conductivity than brass, so you get a nice little bump in print speed. Then we've got a Fetus V6 nozzle. This has just slightly longer threads, so it sits a little bit deeper in the heater block, which will give you a tiny bit of extra heat transfer. But that's nothing compared to these Volcano nozzles. These Volcano nozzles are about twice as long as the standard nozzles, which just gives you more surface area to transfer heat into the plastic, and more contact area between the nozzle and the heater block. This one with the extra part around it, that's just an extension piece that I got with my Fetus Rapido. So it just basically allows you to convert the thread length of a Volcano nozzle to that of a standard nozzle. So you can just thread that into a regular heater block. It's not going to be as good as having a full Volcano heater block, but it's a lot easier to install. And finally, we come to the last item, which is the main event. This is a Volcano CHT nozzle. So if you've seen my previous content on CHT nozzles, you'll know you can effectively double your print speeds because it melts the plastic so much more rapidly than anything else. The secret to the CHT's rapid heat transfer is the inlet geometry. If you look at a normal nozzle, they just drill a hole in the top and the plastic goes in there. But if you look at the CHT nozzle, you can see it's a little bit more complicated. It's got this three-lobed intake design with a solid thing in the middle that basically forces the filament to split up into three channels, which greatly increases the heat transfer rate. I'm going to give you a short introduction to heat transfer, which is a field of mechanical engineering where you study how heat moves from one place to another. So if we look at our normal heater block here, you can see there's the heater cartridge right in this little cavity, and we've got our heater block, and then into that heater block we insert a nozzle. Heat always flows from the hottest to the coldest component in any system. So during steady state operation, the heater cartridge is the hottest component, followed by the heater block, then the nozzle, than the plastic itself. Also, in the middle of that, you're heating and cooling this thermistor, which is registering the temperature and helping you control this whole system. Each component has a certain amount of thermal resistance. To make things even more confusing, the interface between items has a significant amount of thermal resistance. So this is a pretty complex system, and there's a lot of heat transfer that's going on behind the scenes whenever you're running your 3D printer. So our goal here is to get heat from the heater cartridge into the plastic but it has to go through all these components first. One of the easiest ways to increase heat transfer is to just use a material that's more thermally conductive. So using copper instead of aluminum pretty much halves the thermal resistance of any specific component. So on high-end machines, you'll see copper nozzles and copper heater blocks. You can also reduce the thermal resistance between components of the hot end, and that's where materials like this boron nitride paste come in. It's basically a high temperature thermal paste. If you used regular computer thermal paste on your hot end, it would probably just start smoking and maybe catch on fire. So basically you're gonna to wanna to use this boron nitride paste instead. Boron nitride paste has high thermal conductivity and it can squish between parts, which increases the contact area between them. And that'll help significantly reduce your thermal resistance. So on a hot end in general, you're using materials that have a high amount of thermal conductivity. Copper, aluminum, and brass are all pretty good. But you know what isn't very thermally conductive? Plastic. So the plastic itself and the interface between the nozzle and the plastic is actually one of the areas with the highest thermal resistance. And a fun fact about ABS, a lot of people like printing with ABS for their high-speed printers like Vorons and stuff because ABS is more thermally conductive than PLA. So it's easier to transfer the heat into the plastic. But anyways, the interface between the plastic and the nozzle is a very critical area of heat transfer. By splitting the filament up into these three smaller channels, you're greatly increasing the amount of heat transfer that occurs because you're pushing that filament out towards the sidewalls and increasing the rate of shear of that plastic. One of the fastest ways to increase heat transfer into a fluid is to start shearing it. 
That's just forcing the molecules of that liquid to slide against each other, which helps mix it and move the hot stuff into the cold stuff and vice versa. Thermodynamics and heat transfer is a very interesting subject, but before I get too far down this thermodynamics rabbit hole, I'm going to get back to upgrading my 3D printer. In the essence of saving time, I'm just going to take this adapter off of the Fetus Volcano hot end and put it onto the Volcano CHT hot end. I got a new vial of this boron nitride thermal paste. My only complaint about this product is they only give you enough to do about 100 3D printers, so I ran out in a week. You just want to smear as much as possible. Oh geez. Alright, I gotta hurry up and install this because I got this stuff all over my hands now. I think they use boron nitride paste in cosmetics, so like makeup and stuff. So it should be pretty safe, but the official recommendation is to not get it on your hands. I'm just gonna take this off, turn on the 3D printer, so I can easily unthread this nozzle. Interestingly enough, this Sprite hot end comes with a brass nozzle pre-installed, and it looks like the spare was the copper one. So if you have one of these Sprite hot end kits, you've got a free nozzle upgrade in the box, so you might as well put that on. I'm just gonna unscrew the nozzle here. And then I'm gonna turn the printer off. We don't need the printer to be heated for this nozzle installation. I'm going to make sure every square millimeter of these threads is covered in this boron nitride paste. That'll make sure I have maximum heat transfer between this and the heater block. Also, something to note is that a majority of the heat transfer occurs up here towards the top of the nozzle because that's where the cold plastic is entering and the rate of heating is proportional to the temperature difference. So while that cold plastic is coming in, it's prime time for heating it up. All right, now that this heater block has cooled off a little bit, I'm gonna screw this nozzle in. And I'm actually just gonna take some of this and kind of dab it in there. Oof. Okay. I also got this 1.5 Newton meter nozzle wrench from Slice Engineering, because it kept breaking things. So having a torque wrench is nice because it makes sure that you're not over torquing things. So I'm gonna hold onto the block and just tighten this there we go, and it just turns over, gives you one click, and that lets you know it's all tight. The last thing I want to address here is this Volcano adapter collar. It's kind of just hanging out at the bottom here, but I'm going to screw this all the way up to the top. Having this adapter piece butted up against the heater block is a good thing, because now I've got heat transferring directly from this heater block into this adapter, which is lowering the amount of thermal resistance between the heater cartridge and the nozzle, and ultimately the plastic. So to make sure I get my torque right, I'm going to just tighten this down a little bit. I'm just applying a small amount of torque with this wrench. Then I'm going to come in here with this other thing and tighten that down too. All right, so this thing is ready to rock now. Um, one thing you'll notice is that this cooling vent doesn't really line up anymore. It's just kind of blowing straight into the side of the nozzle. So we're going to have to replace this which is where my next upgrade comes in. This is a fan shroud that I designed, and I've put some of the finest fans that I have on here. I've got this Sunon fan up top, and this Noctua fan on the side. This Noctua fan is awesome because it's super quiet, and the Sunon fan is actually pretty quiet for how much air it moves. So this is gonna be an awesome little setup for this machine. However, one of the annoying things about the Sprite extruder is that it's difficult to upgrade because of these small plugs that they use. So the solution to this problem is one of these breakout boards that I designed. So in the box you've got this nice little breakout board. This is from the limited edition that I did when I first launched this thing. There's still a few available on my website, but I'm going to run out of stock pretty soon. These first ones were all handmade by me. I've got my little logo on there, and it's this matte black and gold color scheme, which looks really cool. So while I'm talking about this board, I want to give a huge thanks to anyone that's bought one of these or contributed on my Patreon because that's really what's helping me fund these crazy projects and future products that I'm going to launch. Let's get this thing installed so you can see what it's all about. So we'll just undo these screws, unplug all these wires, then take this breakout board off. There's just poor craftsmanship on these Creality boards. They have some leftover stuff, just kind of gunk on the back. I love how blingy it is, but really this is a functional upgrade. I'm going to plug in this cable, and you've got to be very careful to plug it in the right way. There's a square key on this connector that's like back here. You want to make sure that it's on the bottom where this arrow is pointing. So just plug it in like that. Then we're going to use this cable clamp right here to hold the wire in place. 
You just want to make sure that it doesn't come loose while this is printing because that can damage your board. So the main reason I made this upgrade board is because I didn't like these small fan connectors and I don't like this small stepper motor connector either. So instead of just complaining about it, I decided to spend a couple hundred hours developing my own board. Since I've got this Noctua fan on the side, I don't need that heat and sink fan anymore. So to get that fan out, I just have to unscrew this one at the bottom, this screw on the left side, and this screw on the right side. Then I can pop this whole thing off. While I'm at it, I'm gonna take the stock part cooling fan off too. And I'm gonna take this little fan off. If you were wondering what the Sprite extruder looks like without any fans on it, or the breakout board, this is it. It actually looks pretty cool. Now I'm just gonna reinstall everything. All right, there we go, that's all installed. Now I take my fan duct and just install it onto the side here. It fits on pretty nicely. With my breakout board, I was able to just plug these fans into the back. The Noctua fan has a small resistor in series with it to drop the voltage down. I'm gonna move the volcano nozzle till it's just touching. Then I'm gonna move my Z-axis limit switch up a little bit. And if we look at the fan duct alignment, it could be better. One of the reasons the original CHT nozzle was such a good upgrade is that you just switch it out and everything's pretty much lined up already. I want to make a volcano compatible version of this fan duct, but for now I'm just going to unscrew this and I'll just clip off some of this. I have a hand drill here, but instead of drilling through this, I'm just going to melt through it. You usually end up with slightly stronger parts when you melt your holes into it because it kind of reforms some plastic around the hole. And I'm going to do this screw up at the top. There's a metal joining process that's pretty similar to what I was doing with the drill there, where you just spin it until it melts things. It's like this friction stir welding, I think is what it's called. It's a pretty cool process. I guess you could call this friction stir 3D printer modding. It may seem kind of silly to messily modify some of your 3D prints to get them to fit, but I guarantee you if you've modified this and fit tested it in the real world before you go and CAD model it, you'll have a much higher success rate when it comes to your next part being printed and actually working as intended. Time to turn it on and see how loud the fans are. Something don't seem right. I really appreciate how quiet this thing is. Just listen to it. All right, we're ready for the first print. Let's hit it. It's extruding layers of plastic that are thicker than a piece of filament. The last time I did this, it looked like black licorice, and this time it looks like red licorice. This is printing at 25 cubic millimeters per second. A typical Bowden setup can only handle about six cubic millimeters per second, and the stock Sprite hot end can do 12 to 18 reliably. Right here, we're cranking out 25 cubic millimeters per second, and this thing isn't even breaking a sweat. There's something about these thick lines of plastic that just look like candy to me. It's really tempting. I just kind of want to eat it. Nice, yummy plastic coming out. All right, now we started on the second layer, so the part cooling fan kicked on. But now that we're on the second layer, I think I'm ready to try turning the speed up a little bit. 160% speed will be 40 cubic millimeters per second. No indication of skipped steps, even at this speed. You know what, let's just keep going. Um, 180% will be 45 cubic millimeters per second. The extrusion still looks pretty good, but I'm gonna turn the temperature up just a little bit. I'm pulling up with about five pounds of force and it's not even slowing it down at all. I think 50 cubic millimeters per second is a little bit too fast. I've got kind of this rippled texture here. That tends to happen with these CHT nozzles when you're pushing them to extreme speeds. For the outer wall, I want it to be pretty high quality. So I'm gonna turn the speed down. We're gonna go back down to 30 cubic millimeters per second. I really like using a large nozzle and slow extrusion rates. The chunky layer lines with their distinct ridges looks really cool if you ask me. Later, we have this. 
So this thing was absolutely ripping. I used up a sixth of a kilogram of PLA and had a volumetric flow rate of about 33 to 35 cubic millimeters per second on this print. Here's that little loop that the printer puts down before the print. But yeah, this is a nice and strong little thing here. Looking great. One thing that I really like about printing with these really fat and thick layer lines is that you achieve insane volumetric flow rates so you can print large objects quickly and you can print them with thick walls so they're really strong. But you're doing this while maintaining a very low print head speed. There's virtually no ghosting on this and you get these really perfect looking layer lines. I mean, just look at these. It's crazy how consistent they are. It almost looks like a computer rendering. Just listen to this. Pretty strong. So if you ever get tired of printing flimsy models, you should try just using more plastic. I mean, more plastic makes it more stronger. It's pretty simple, guys. Nice. Now I'm printing out a Benchy. Now that the printer's moving a bit faster, you can hear the stepper noise quite a bit more. So I guess that's another reason why I like the slow and steady print style, because it helps keep everything super quiet. This is a 50% infill Benchy with super thick walls. So this is gonna be one of the toughest Benchies around. And at this end, you can push it and displace it pretty easily. This is an issue on pretty much any machine that has a single lead screw for the Z-axis because you end up with an assembly that's not very stiff. When you're doing travel moves or when you're printing, you end up kind of scraping over the tops of the last layer. Turning on Z-hops really helps with this, but it's always somewhat of an issue, especially when you're printing large solid objects like this. So you can hear there's kind of a rumbling noise when it moves across the surface. That rumbling noise is the printer kind of bumping over the tops of the previously printed layers. And eventually this can get bad enough to the point where you can get some skipped layers like I did on this print. So that's kind of one of the inherent disadvantages of having this wobbly frame. On any high-end machine you'll have dual lead screw z-axes, so when the print head is moving back and forth, it's held in position really rigidly which prevents bumps from being formed in the first place. And also if there are bumps, it'll just kind of skate across the top of them without the print head moving. What happens is you have this kind of piling up effect where the previous layer leaves a bump and then you go over it while extruding and it moves up a little bit over that bump. And then the next layer, it's moving up over the previous layer's bump. So it just kind of builds up over time and you end up with skipped steps like this once the bumps get too hard to cross over. Once it gets to the top half of the benchy, you're kind of in the clear in terms of this collision stuff happening. It's when you're printing a lot of solid layers that you really have to worry about it. And to relate it to something else in 3D printing, CNC Kitchen just did a video on transparent prints where you squish one layer on top of the other hard enough so that it squeezes out all of the void space in between the layers. So you end up with parts that are pretty much transparent. With a single Z-axis lead screw, you're gonna have trouble getting that kind of transparent print just because you'll be unable to really squish that plastic down one layer after the other and really fill up all those voids. When you're extruding extra plastic with this, you're actually having some backwards force. It's kinda of like for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, you're generating pressure at the nozzle head that's spraying out onto a surface and that's actually creating a physical force that's pushing up on the hot end and that'll vertically displace the hot end. The simplest way around this is to just have a second lead screw on the z-axis instead of a single cantilevered beam. It's something like 16 times stronger when you support both ends. It depends on the exact geometry of the machine, but you get the idea. It's much stronger when you have a second support over here. The other factor at play here is the aspect ratio of the filament that's being laid down. I'm laying down a layer right now that's 0.4 millimeters thick and 1.3 millimeters wide. So when you're trying to lay down a really thin layer like that, a thin and wide layer, you end up with more back pressure. If you make this taller, so it's more like a square section, you end up with less back pressure because the filament is squishing out to the sides instead of having all of that force being relieved by pushing upwards. And the other thing is, since this is a large diameter nozzle, 
I have a larger area for that pressure to act on, so I end up with a much larger force that pushes up. So when you're printing with large nozzles like this, it's ideal to have a second Z-axis lead screw and just a stiff system overall. The easiest way around these downsides is to print with really fat layers like this and print in vase mode. Since this is only one layer thick, the plastic is able to relieve the stress by flowing out to either side of the nozzle. So it kind of automatically relieves any stresses that would build up versus when you're printing a solid object like this, there's nothing to relieve that stress and you're gonna have to fight the plastic to show it who's boss. Wow, that was pretty fast. It just clicked over to 24. And if that includes the warm-up time, then maybe I had a benchy in like 23 minutes. Not bad at all. All right, now I'm going pretty crazy. So the base print speed on this print is 25 cubic millimeters per second. Right now I'm at 240% speed, which means I'm printing at 60 cubic millimeters per second. And I turn the temperature way up because one of the things you can do to increase heat transfer is to just increase the temperature of the heat source. And that's relatively safe to do here. You really don't want your PLA even getting up to 260 degrees. So you might be wondering like, why is it okay to set my heater to 260? The concept of overheating a heat source to accelerate heat transfer is pretty common. When you're trying to cook a pizza, you set your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. But if your pizza actually got up to 425 degrees Fahrenheit, it would just be like a pile of ashes. It's not going to be tasty and delicious. But the idea is that you have the oven at a temperature that's way hotter than the pizza needs to be, but you put it in there for a fixed amount of time, and then you take it out once it gets hot enough. Well, a similar thing is going on inside of this hot end. When you're printing in vase mode, you have a constant stream of plastic going through, so you know exactly how much time the plastic spends in the hot zone before it exits the nozzle. However, you would run into issues if you were printing something like this Benchy because the printer stops and slows down and speeds up all the time. So you don't know the exact amount of time that the plastic is spending in the hot zone. When it's printing one of these big perimeters on the Benchy, the plastic that's being fed in might only spend a little bit of time in the hot zone before it's extruded. So just to use some example numbers, let's say the plastic is only spending one second in the hot zone as it's being extruded through the nozzle. When it slows down and does these more detailed features, it might spend five to 10 seconds in the hot zone, just kind of sitting there and slowly being extruded before it exits the nozzle. So if it's spending too much time in that heater block, then it can start to burn and cause all sorts of problems. But that's one of the great things about vase mode. Everything's steady state, it's just constantly feeding filament through and you have a little bit more control over what's going on here. 60 cubic millimeters per second is nothing to scoff at, but let's see if we can go up to 75. All right, here we go, we're going to 75 now. If I could turn my temperature up even higher, I would, but the version of firmware on this machine isn't gonna let me go above 260 degrees. But it's not skipping any steps, it's just chewing through this filament ridiculously fast. Meanwhile, if you look over here at this filament spool, it's being fed pretty rapidly. This is insane. And even at these speeds, the print head is still moving relatively slow. So if I hold the microphone up to it, you can hear it's running nice and quietly. All right, 75 cubic millimeters per second. Now print quality isn't gonna be as good as this one, this is just like that perfect glossy finish that I was getting at about 35 cubic millimeters per second. It's still chewing through the filament and laying down the plastic. That's pretty impressive, even if it does kind of look like garbage. Who knows, maybe you like this kind of wobbly aesthetic and you don't mind it. If that's your thing, then you can just go ahead and print this as fast as you want. So make sure to leave a comment and let me know if you want to see me try and hit 100 cubic millimeters per second. I also might need to beef up my part cooling printing at these flow rates.
All right, so this print is going fine. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this up to 100 cubic millimeters per second. Let's see what happens. And then, yeah, it's skipping. It's skipping. It can't do 100 cubic millimeters per second. I'm just gonna stop the print now. Oh, and I wanna keep feeding filament while the printer's hot so that this 260 degree stuff doesn't just stay there. Make sure that stuff doesn't get cooked into the nozzle. All right, now we're probably safe. All right, so here's 75 cubic millimeters per second. Probably could have pushed it even faster if I was able to use those higher temperatures. Someone was telling me that I have a weird version of the board in this machine and I can't flash firmware on it. That would be a real bummer because it's gonna make it hard to get to 100 cubic millimeters per second. But if enough people ask for it in the comments, then I suppose I'll figure out how to do it. I think I resolved all of the initial complaints that I had with this machine. Originally, I thought the parts fan was too loud, so I replaced it with this super quiet Noctua fan. The part cooling fan wasn't providing quite enough cooling, so I upgraded it to this special fan duct and used one of these really nice Sunon 5015 fans. And I also replaced the stock breakout board with my upgraded modder board, which should allow me to install more upgrades in the future more easily. And this thing's got absolutely insane print speeds now. A good Bowden setup can print seven or eight cubic millimeters per second, and we were just printing at 75, so that's a 10 times increase. One of the fans that I haven't really talked about since the first video I made about this machine is the one in the base. I added a 150 ohm resistor in series to it, and that made it super quiet. It's basically inaudible. Oh, okay, well the fan actually isn't spinning, but the whole printer was working without that fan, so just having a small printer that can do this kind of thing really easily is super fun. You can make all sorts of practical smallish objects that are super robust and durable. That's one of the things that I kind of dislike about 3D printed goods is they tend to be flimsy and you kind of have to be careful with them. Like take this bunny for example, I can just, okay, it's actually pretty strong. Um, not the best example. Essentially what I've done here is taken the smallest printer that I have and put the biggest nozzle on it and just have it crank parts out like this. Here's the 20 something minute Benchy that I made with this printer. If I need small detailed stuff, I can always swap the hot end out for basically a stock hot end. Just unplug that ribbon cable, put this in and plug the ribbon cable into this. So I can have super detail when I want it, but also have super smooth, big, chunky prints like this. Let me know if there's anything else you want me to try with this Ender 2 Pro. I think I'm ready to put it into retirement and start working on some of the other printers that I have. I'm getting a Trong C Crux in for review soon which is another similar printer in this kind of size range. So it'll be fun to compare that to this printer here. But anyways, if you've made it to the end of the video and you haven't liked and subscribed yet, I think you know what to do. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next crazy modding 3D printing episode.